Welcome, it's your friendly neighborhood badger here, and I am back to talk about the Path of Exile Manifesto. Welcome to Badger's Manifesto Text to Speech. Today, to balance the seemingly difficult topics we have ahead of us, I will be reading the manifesto in the smoothest way possible. So without further ado, let's get into it. Game Balance in Path of Exile Expedition With every league release, we review and rebalance many aspects of Path of Exile to update and reinvigorate old mechanics while trimming some power from strategies that stand too far above the rest. This time around, our changes are far more thorough. As a part of Expedition League announcement, Chris has already talked about a number of changes, but we'll go over them quickly here with a bit more of a discussion of their consequences and some associated changes we've made as a result. Over time, the introduction of new mechanics updates to existing balance and improved collective understanding of the game has caused the damage of characters to be way too high. Many players are able to compete mid-difficulty boss fights in a fraction of a second without any interesting interaction. Our ability to create interesting boss fights and monster combat is removed when players are routinely killing boss killing those monsters or bosses before they have used a single ability. Because of this, we're significantly reducing player damage at higher levels to greatly increase the challenge of endgame content, and are raising monster life at lower levels to make the leveling experience in line with our vision of how Path of Exile should be. Many of these changes are intended to affect every character in the game in some way, but we're still going to continue our tradition of making changes to the most powerful and least powerful mechanics to improve build diversity. Information already provided in the announcement livestream has been reproduced in italics. I will speak the italics with a little bit more of an emphasis so you do know, if you're listening without the visuals, that I'm speaking in italics. The Great Support Gem Reduction This is a relevant section from the live stream. For a while now, we have been concerned at the power gap between support gems. There are gems that grant huge multiplicative damage bonuses, and there are gems that do a bunch of stuff you don't really care about. When you're building a character, by far the correct choice is to just stack on all the multiplicative damage bonuses and ignore all the interesting utility support gems because their opportunity cost is just too high. We are reducing the damage bonuses on the support gems that are clearly just about huge damage boosts and trying to give them impactful and appropriate downsides. For example, the Control Destruction Support Gem now penalizes critical strikes multiplicatively. Overall, this works out to be somewhere around 20%, potentially as high as 40% damage reduction for a character using a fully six-linked skill with entirely damaged support gems. There's much less impact for characters that use utility support gems or who didn't have a six link setup. This achieves two goals for us. Firstly, the gap between the good and bad support gems has been narrowed, creating more interesting build opportunities. Secondly, player damage output in the endgame is reduced, which is a goal for this balance pass. As I mentioned, we want to iteratively restore challenge to Path of Exile. It is worth clarifying that we haven't buffed unused utility support gems as part of this balance pass. It's fully intentional that it's a reduction of power for the most damaging ones. What an interesting take from CEO Chris Wilson of Grinding Gear Games, or should I say 
acting head director or whatever his title is. Let's read on, shall we? Damage multipliers between support gems have been standardized following these rules. Number one, gems that provide a useful benefit in addition to damage usually grant less than 25% more damage at gem level 20. These are things I would be guessing, such as your elemental overload. Uh, no, not, uh, sorry, your uh, maybe even, yes, controlled destruction with the critical strike potentially, or uh, the concentrated effect maybe. They do have downsides, we will see. Number two, those that provide only a damage bonus or have only a very mild restriction or penalty grant around 30 to 35% more damage. Number three, those with downsides or restrictions grant between 38 and 48% more damage, depending on how severe the cost of using the support is. And number four, a couple of existing supports have had the downside added, allowing us to keep the damage multiplier relatively high. As an example, melee physical damage now grants supported skills 10% less attack speed. Certain builds, such as Earthquake, Bleed, are barely affected by this downside. Because the damage multiplier hasn't changed, the support is almost as strong as before. Minion damage causes minions from supported skills to have 25% less life, so you might want to consider other supports if your minions scale damage from their life or if they're not tough enough when supported. This change provides more choice for builds that can be supported by a variety of support gems and lessens the relative damage loss incurred by using a support gem that doesn't provide direct damage, like Chain or Ancestral Call. There are now builds that will benefit more by using far more interesting support gem setups than were previously balanced around using only high damage support gems. It is time for a coffee break. I will take one sip of coffee and continue. Let's continue. A number of projectile and bow support gems, like Barrage, Greater Multiple Projectiles and Chain haven't been changed, so builds using these more interesting projectile support effects will have lost, so, uh, will have lost much less damage than other builds. This has caused certain bow builds to be a strong relative to be strong relative to other skill setups at late game. With our buffs to skills like Barrage, 15% damage increase at gem level 20, Lightning Arrow, 15% damage increase at gem level 20, Split Arrow, 10% more attack speed at all levels, these add up to really help bring bows up in power to relative uh, relative to other builds. Many trap support gems haven't been adjusted, so trap builds will not suffer much of a damage loss compared to using other skills at high levels. The trap support, cluster trap support, multiple trap support, charge trap support, advanced trap support, and swift assembly support are unchanged. This has caused traps to be stronger relative to other skill setups at late game and they'll have more of a reason to use the special trap support gems instead of generic damage support gems. There are buffs to the cooldown trap skills Lightning Spire Trap, 25% more damage at all levels, and Seismic Trap, 40% more damage at all levels, and a drastic increase in area of effect. We have made their wave and strike frequency now scale with trap throwing speed instead of car speed. Yes, this does mean with the Architect's Hand or Slave Driver's Hand unique items, you get immense bonuses, even if you're not a trapper. You can see how trap builds are going to be very powerful. Certain builds that were balanced around having very powerful support gems have lost more damage than others as a result of these changes. To counteract this, a broad selection of skills have received a notable boost in damage at high levels. This won't bring their 6 link damage back to where it was before the reduction to support gem power, it just makes sure they're not punished 
more than other ones by the changes. This predominantly affects skills that use melee weapons, but there are others affected too. In addition, skills that use melee weapons have had a 25% damage increase at gem level 20, and are unchanged at gem level 1. Here's an example of a melee attack that has had its damage increased at gem level 20. In front of you, you can see the ground slam gem. Now, we are seeing buffs in terms of the attack damage percentage and potentially effectiveness of added damage and dealing up to 49% more damage to closer targets. Ground Slam is receiving a buff with the nerfs to support gems. This has the nice side effect of making gem level for these attack skills matter more, and the potential for a 4 linked secondary melee skill like Ancestral Warchief to have barely lost damage. An Ancestral Warchief supported by melee physical damage support, pulverized support, and multi-strike which now applies to totems, has lost 2.5% damage after the damage buff. At the same time, we realize that slams have been overperforming relative to other melee builds for a while. As a result, we have changed the Seismic Cry to no longer provide more damage to exerted attacks. Warcry empowered slams were incredibly powerful, as slams received a damage bonus from Seismic Cry that non-slam melee skills did not have access to. And we are seeing a uh, Seismic Cry gem without the more increased damage, only exerted attacks receiving increased area of effect and increased area of effect per previous attack exerted with some stun threshold. This brings slams more in line with other skills when enhanced by war cries, though they still have the advantage of some so slow slam specific mechanics like the Fist of War support gem. The support gem changes affect six link skills far more than they do those with fewer links because of how each support gem compounds with each other, so the damage loss won't be felt much in the early and mid game. As support gems were generally nerfed far less or not at all at gem level 1, there will be cases during the campaign where buffed skills will have more damage than before, especially for players that struggle to find or craft 5 or 6 link items early in the league. We've numerically buffed the increased critical strikes support, increased critical damage support and night blade support as they were seeing relatively little use for builds that were invested in critical strikes, making sure their effect is more in line with other support gems for a build invested in criticals. In front of you here, you see increased critical damage support with up to 138% to critical strike multiplier at gem level 20. At the top end of character progression, we found that awakened support gems provided too significant of a damage increase over regular support gems. If you had 5 awakened support gems, your 6 link damage could be as high as 50% more damage compared to having regular support gems. The quality of awakened support gems is now the same as on the base support gem. In some cases, such as awakened generosity's level of supported aura skill gems, we have added the quality stat as a reward for leveling the gem to level 5 instead. We have also taken this opportunity to make mana multipliers on support gems more consistent. In general, mana multipliers have gone up slightly, but several gems have had mana multipliers lowered as a result of this pass. Archmage has had its damage based on the mana cost of supported skill lowered, 60% of mana cost from 108% at level 20. This is an insane nerf. Archmage support, as we see in front of us at level 20, gain lightning damage equal to 60% of mana cost. Put your mana builds in the bin, everybody. It now sets your spell's mana cost to be 5% of your maximum unreserved mana instead of 6, as support gem mana multipliers were generally increased across the board. This will be a significant reduction in damage, as mana builds using Archmage were very strong, both offensively and defensively. We've changed the quality bonuses for a variety of support gems that didn't 
make a lot of sense for the base gem. For these, we focused on those that provide speed. For example, greater multiple projectiles now gives projectile damage instead of attack and cast speed. Chain now gives increased chaining range instead of projectile speed. With projectile speed becomes with proje with projectile speed becoming its anomalous quality instead at a lower value. As you can see here on chain support, supported skills have 10% increased chaining range at quality 20%. This is actually quite a large bonus. Faster projectiles now grants a further increased projectile speed instead of attack and cast speed, with the divergent quality becoming increased damage instead. There are lots of individual changes that have been made to support gems which will be revealed in the patch notes tomorrow. That is the section titled Gem Changes. Moving on to Flask System Rework. Before we move on, one more sip of coffee. To start the Flask System Rework, we will read an excerpt from Chris during the live stream. For quite some time, Path of Exile players and developers have been keen for a re big rework to its Flask system. In the end game, Flasks grant really powerful buffs for a number of seconds after use, and these buffs allow the player to kill monsters quickly, filling the Flasks up so that they can be used as soon as they run out. With 5 such flasks equipped, the correct behavior was to spam the 1 to 5 keys repetitively to keep all the flasks up constantly without any downsides. This flask piano playstyle was popular enough that players were improvising devices to hit all these keys at once. Spamming the same keys repetitively to get a set of powerful buffs that rival the power you get from your entire set of equipped items is not a fun game mechanic. It's unbalanced and certainly isn't nice on your wrists. It provides us from balancing the game well for players who aren't smashing their keyboard constantly and seriously restricts the design space we can use on flasks. In addition, certain unique flasks completely outclass other ones in terms of raw damage output. It was pretty clear to us that Path of Exile would be a lot better if we did some serious work on flasks to make sure that their incentives were aligned with fun rather than with spamming blindly. Most utility flasks and unique flasks have been rebalanced. Expect a lot less permanent power from flasks. Flasks that provide raw defense or raw power are the ones with the biggest nerfs. Some flasks have been selectively, selectively buffed a bit if they were underpowered or less popular. In the Expedition expansion, there are now three ways you can use flasks. You can either continue to use the rebalanced ones, the traditional way, or you can apply one of two new types of currency item to your flasks, the Instilling Orb and Enkindling Orb drop as a part of the regular pool drop from regular monsters and chests. The Instilling Orb will cause a flask to be used automatically upon a specific condition being met. For example, when its charges become full or when you become affected by Ignite, this means that in cases where you would previously want to time a specific flask usage, you can now rely on it happening automatically, with the only trade-off being that it may consume charges that you otherwise wouldn't intend it to. There are a variety of different conditions and a random one is enchanted onto your flask, overriding the others each time you use an instilling orb on it. The enkindling orb prevents utility flasks from gaining charges while active but provides a big boost to their effect, duration or various ways they interact with their charges. There are various different types of boosts so you can use more orbs to re-roll for the one you want. When a flask removes a curse, it no longer applies a period of immunity to curses. Flasks that remove ailments now only provide a period of immunity to that ailment if they actually removed it. So, if you get ignited, use a dowsing flask to remove the ignite and to gain immunity for a while. I would like to, as Badger, uh, insert something here. A while actually means one second, as we have seen from some teasers. So it's not actually really a while, 
it's one second. You now can't just spam, spam the flask before you're ignited to be permanently immune. If you want permanent mitigation of ailments, there are other options for your build. Note that we have rebalanced ailment mitigation in general so that there aren't a few options that completely outclass the rest. Monster density in Path of Exile gets a lot higher as you play through the game. When we initially balanced flask charge generation a decade ago, we did not anticipate the levels of monster density we would reach by 2021. Monsters in Act 6 through 10 now generate fewer flask charges, and monsters in maps generate even fewer still. So now, there's a lot more strategy involved with flask use. Flasks don't gain as many charges, so are a little harder to constantly spam and aren't designed to provide such a powerful slew of permanent buffs. But you can control which provide larger than normal effects and which are triggered automatically as a part of your build. We have reworked existing flasks such as Basalt and Aquamarine flasks and have introduced new Corundum and Meme flasks, I mean Gold flasks. What an interesting slew of text from Chris Wilson. Let's jump into the nitty gritty, shall we? The flask rebalance has mostly affected utility flasks. Some have been reworked. The most notable change that hasn't been announced yet is to the diamond flask. It previously granted your critical strikes are lucky. This single effect provided a massive boost to your critical strike chance, more than any other source in the game. Because flasks no longer provide that much power, it has been changed to provide 100% increased critical strike chance instead, more in line with the power of other flasks. Note that this can now be affected by increases to flask effect, and the ability to roll the surgeon's prefix on the flask type has been restored. With the changes to diamond flask, we didn't want the sulfur flask to be the best critical strike flask, so enemies on consecrated ground no longer have additional base chance to be critically hit. We have also improved some underused utility flasks such as ruby, topaz and sapphire flasks which now have a base duration of 5 seconds from 4 and consume 20 of 50 charges on use from 30 of 60 so they're able to be used more and this has naturally improved the unique flasks that, these, that use these base types. Unique flasks have all been reviewed, and many have been rebalanced or reworked. In general, those that multiplied damage or provided massive defense have had this damage bonus reduced significantly. Certain unique flasks have instead received penalties to flask uptime instead of reducing their powerful stats. For example, Dying Sun still grants 15 to 25% area of effect and two additional projectiles, but now consumes more flask charges and has a lower duration. With an enkindling orb that provides flask effect, you can get three additional projectiles, and when combined with the Pathfinder Ascendancy or items and some passive skills, that can become four additional projectiles relatively easily. With an enkindling orb that provides duration, you can offset some of the uptime penalties on the flask. The introduction of enkindling orbs in combination with unique utility flask has opened up some interesting new interactions. Coruscating Elixir is on the ruby base type, which, as mentioned above, has had its base duration increased from 4 to 5. When combined with the duration in Kindling Orb Outcome, it now has a duration of over 15 seconds. Wow. Just look at that, everybody. As we see in front of us, a Coruscating Elixir Ruby Flask lasting 15.5 seconds with an 89% increased duration from a an orb, but it does gain no charges during its flask effect. We have also added 45% increased flask duration to the passive tree, lowering the amount given by cluster jewel notables as a result. This combination of mechanics has implications with certain unique belt <coughs> soul thirst. <coughs> Replica Rumi's Concoction has a higher, uh, has a huge duration reduction, but with the duration in Kindling Orb effect you can nullify this, providing massive defense if you can cancel out the slowing effect while you have enough flask charges. We have also taken this opportunity to review flask passive skills. 
Flask effect is now mostly found around the ranger area of the tree, and some new passives have been added. In front of you, you see Natural Remedies. Natural Remedies gives 20% increased flask effect duration, flasks apply to you have 10% increased effect, and remove maim and hinder when you use a flask. The Enduring Mana Flasks no longer pen penalizes duration, so you have to press the button less, but it causes the flask to provide much less mana than before. Especially now that using a flask slot for a mana flask is a smaller loss of power, it has been rebalanced to provide more appropriate level of mana recovery. The Adrenaline modifier on flasks now gives far less movement speed, 6 to 8% increased movement speed, down from 20 to 30%, putting more of the focus on enhancing a Quicksilver flask's effect with associated costs, rather than rolling a single modifier that granted almost as much speed as the Quicksilver flask itself. The Iron Skin and Reflexes suffixes have also been reduced, granting 40 to 60% increased armor or evasion, down from 60 to 100%. That is Flask Changes. Let's move on to Player Ailment Mitigation, shall we? Right before we do that, one more sip of the coffee is necessary. Once again, we will select a relevant selection from the live stream. Player Ailment Mitigation Flasks that remove ailments now only provide a period of immunity to that ailment if they actually removed it. So if you get ignited, use a dowsing flask to remove the ignite and gain immunity for a while. You now can't just spam the flask before you're ignited to be permanently immune. If you want permanent mitigation of ailments, there are other options for your build. Note that we have rebalanced ailment mitigation in general, so that there aren't a few options that completely outclass the rest. Thank you very much, Chris Wilson. Let's get into the text in front of us. In addition to changes to how flask modifiers protect from ailments, we are also reworking how players mitigate ailments in other ways. The intent here is there shouldn't be a simple low investment option for any character to mitigate every single ailment. You should focus on mitigating the effects you're most threatened by, and just reducing the effects of those you can probably handle. For example, a change to aqua aquamarine flasks spe to specifically reduce the effective freeze will let you continue to act while frozen without mitigating it entirely. If you craft your aquamarine flask to maximize flask effect, it can reduce a freeze to the point of it almost being ignored. We've made a number of changes to mechanics that protect against all elemental ailments at once. Most ascendancy skills that mitigated all ailments now provide partial or no mitigation. For example, the Raider now grants 50% chance to avoid elemental ailments while phasing instead of full elemental ailment immunity while phasing. This change means that raiders don't trivialize elemental ailments from the get-go, but can still get full mitigation with a little bit of investment elsewhere. The Hierophant and Pathfinder retain some level of elemental ailment mitigation, while the Inquisitor and Elementalist no longer have any at all, as we felt that the Ascendancy passives that provided the elemental ailment mitigation, alongside other properties, were sufficiently powerful without it. Modifiers on gear that mitigate all ailments have also been reviewed and generally lowered in power, so it's a much higher gear and passive investment to gain immunity to every ailment at once, making it more reasonable to focus on mitigating the specific ailments that are most problematic for your builds. We want to review new avenues for players to mitigate bleed, excuse me, bleed, corrupted blood and curses given how common bleed and curse removal flasks were. As a result, we have added extra support on the passive tree to mitigate bleeding, corrupted blood and curses, through new stats on existing notables or a new passive cluster. We've also made some minor changes to the Pantheon powers. 
The upgraded Soul of Ralakesh now grants you cannot gain Corrupted Blood while there are at least 5 Corrupted Blood stacks on you, and the upgraded Soul of Yugul now grants 20% reduced effective curses on you, replacing their previous bonuses. It is now time to talk about something not talked about in the previous teasers. Poison. Poison now inherently deals 50% more damage. What a banger to start off with. We didn't like the poison builds felt pigeonholed into playing assassin due to the extremely strong poison related bonuses and relied heavily on the Coralito's signature unique flask in the late game. We've reduced the power of the assassin's poison notable passives to be more in line with the kind of damage increases an ascendancy usually gives. Noxious Strike no longer has a 30% to damage over time multiplier for poison, and the increased poison duration for each poison you have inflicted recently is now capped at 100%. Toxic Delivery now has poison you inflict with critical strikes deals 25% more damage from 50%. Coralito's signature has been reworked to more directly benefit poison builds dealing critical strikes rather than any poison build. As we can see here, you get a 30% to damage over time multiplier for poison from critical strikes during flask effect when you use Coralito's signature. And you, gain, you do gain 25% chance to poison on hit. The Pathfinder's Master Toxicist, Notable, has received a smaller nerf, now causing poisons you inflict during flask effect to have a 20% chance to deal 100% more damage up from 30% while keeping its poison spread mechanic. The overall result is the poison build should feel far better earlier on and now allow for a wider selection of viable ascendancy choices such as the occultist. Poison builds were now were also guilty of having a particularly uninteresting array of support gems, with most purely providing an unconditional more damage multiplier. We have reworked the poison support gem to now be called Critical Strike Affliction Support. This support gem provides damage over time multiplier to damaging ailments from critical strikes, so it can also be used with ignites and bleeds too. The lesser poison support has also been renamed to chance to poison support. Note this change also affects all monsters as well, as in general we felt poisons applied from monsters were unthreatening compared to other damaging ailments. However, we have lowered the poison damage of certain monsters that had significantly powerful poisons already, such as Alhismin the Hunter, such that the overall power is no damage buff compared to before. Thank you very much, Grinding Gear Games. Now moving on to Ailment Thresholds. Now that player damage has been reduced, we've reviewed our Ailment Threshold calculations to compensate for the lower damage of fully supported skills. It's now much easier to apply stronger non-damaging ailments on enemies with less damage, especially on skills less heavily supported. We've also lowered ailment threshold of particularly tough endgame encounters so the chill or shock investment is worthwhile on these encounters. Their threshold is now only slightly higher than regular map bosses. As a much requested quality of life change, Players can now see the effect of non-damaging elemental ailments on enemies and themselves so you can finally determine how powerful your shocks are on enemies and thus know what benefit they are giving you. This also applies to ailments applied to you and the buff granted to you by the cruelty support. Next moving on to trigger effect costs. Here is the relevant section from the live stream. When we're designing skills for Path of Exile, the mana cost of the skill is a mechanism to allow us to have large impactful effects. Bigger skills should cost more mana to cast. Unfortunately, this entire mechanism is currently bypassed by triggering skills as this skips their mana cost. This basically means that we can't design really powerful spells. In 3.15, triggering skills through support gems will require paying their mana cost. In fact, Sometimes it now costs more than casting the gem by hand. Thankfully, this isn't very hard with well-constructed characters. Certain support gems that were originally disabled from supporting triggered skills, such as Arcane Surge, now can be used to support them. 
builds that use triggered skills are some of the most interesting characters in Path of Exile and are often the best representation of craziness that our character customization system allows. We're confident that they are still just as powerful as before, but we now have more interesting design space to explore with future skills. As mentioned on the live stream, most triggered skills now cost mana. This was changed to add an additional opportunity cost to trigger builds, as they already bypass various restrictions like cast time. Some triggers have higher costs than others, most notably cast on damage taken, which previously had no cost at all, outside of taking up sockets. Some positive results of this change are that Archmage can now be applied to triggered skills, and Reap now gains blood charges when triggered. Spells triggered with Mjolnir or cast on death don't require you to pay the costs. Now moving on to a movement section. Flame dash, dash, and smoke mine. Here is the relevant section from the live stream. As you know, most of the interaction with monster behavior is essentially bypassed if you're using an extremely effective movement skill. This is okay if you specialize deeply into customizing that skill, but it's currently the default state for any character if you use Flame Dash, Smoke Mine, or Dash without any further investment. Their skills have been rebalanced to be more in line with the other movement skills. These are not new, huge numeric nerfs, but do mean that, their scope for improving, that there is scope for improving the performance of these skills by specializing around them. Many patches ago, we greatly buffed certain travel skills that were cooldown gated, most notably Flame Dash, Smoke Mine, and Dash. They provided a huge amount of mobility and travel speed with little opportunity cost, so we've lowered their values to be more appropriate for their investment. Smoke Mine has been most heavily affected. It now gives a 1 second burst of speed. The speed starts at 20% and scales up to 29%, so its speed growth isn't as extreme at no cost. Its smoke cloud size has been increased. It now has a cooldown of 5 seconds, rather than 2.5, and has no cooldown recovery as it levels. Chris mentioned in the live stream that the changes to these skills are not huge numerical nerfs, Smoke Mine is an exception. However, despite that it is still very good at achieving the purpose of giving the player mobility and utility benefits, it is still very good for evading damage and traversing across areas. Dash's cooldown time is now 2.5 seconds from 2, and has a 0 to 19% increased cooldown recovery rate from 0 to 57%. Flame Dash's cooldown time is now 3.5 seconds from 3, and has a 0 to 19% increased cooldown recovery rate from 0 to 47%. Its cast time is now 0 0.8 seconds from 0 0.7 seconds, but it still retains its cast time bypass if not used in rapid succession. The second wind support gem has now been changed to have a much higher mana multiplier and a penalty rather than a boost to cooldown recovery speed, so it's now a choice rather than a support gem if you uh, always use it on a skill if you had a socket spare and doesn't provide such a growth in uptime for the above skills. Second wind support now has a 200% a cost and reservation multiplier. Very interesting. Moving on to some smaller topics of specific gems. Arcane Surge. Arcane Surge now provides increased mana regeneration rather than a percentage of mana per second, and no longer provides an increase to cast speed. This means that it now provides slightly more mana recovery at low levels before you've invested in mana regeneration, and works better with clarity, but doesn't multiply with increases to mana regeneration at higher levels. Fortify Effect. Fortify is intended to be a natural benefit of playing a melee character, not a primary defense to invest into. Over time, we've introduced larger values and more sources of Fortify effect, to the point where it can almost completely mitigate damage from hits. We're aiming of having 40% less damage taken from hits with Fortify being on the upper end of defensive power achievable with heavy investment, so you can't rely on entirely on Fortify. Hence, all sources of Fortify effect have been reviewed almost all significantly nerfed or replaced with something that is okay to be stacked. Moving on to damage over time multiplier. Uh oh, Badger's favorite type of damage. 
Reviewing sources of damage over time multiplier, this powerful damage bonus for damage over time skills has benefited disproportionately from cluster jewels, taking importance away from other sources. We've replaced all sources of the stat on non-notable cluster jewel passive skills with the standard damage increase to be consistent with other medium cluster jewels with damage bonuses, and lowered the values or replaced the stat entirely on cluster jewel notables. To put more importance on weapons, We've changed the large type specific damage over time multiplier modifier on weapons to be a suffix rather than a prefix with no reduction in power. This makes it more in line with its intended equivalent, critical strike multiplier. You'll now be able to obtain a better damage over time weapon than ever before. Veiled mods. After the rework to the veiled item system in 3.14, We've reviewed how Veiled Chaos Orb and Ashling crafts from Betrayal Safe Houses work, and have made some changes to make crafting less deterministic in the outcomes, as well as the Unveiled Modifiers can be very powerful additions to an item. Veiled Modifiers no longer count as crafted modifiers, so you can't easily remove them if you add the wrong modifier type while Ashling is crafting. While Ashling crafting. This has the advantage of now being able to block modifiers you do not want to unveil by crafting a mod you do not want to unveil on the item prior to unveiling. By restricting the pool of mods you can unveil, you have a higher chance of unveiling the mod you want. Ashling's crafting bench that adds a veiled modifier now first removes a random modifier, so it is riskier to use as a later step of item crafting rather than an obvious final step because of its very consistent modifier pool. Veiled Chaos Orbs can now long no longer be used to get multiple Veiled modifiers on an item. Previously, this was possible taking advantage of meta crafting modifiers or fractured modifiers. Dual Attributes modifiers can no longer be rolled with other modifiers that grant flat amounts of attributes of the same types, the exception being those that grant all attributes. We didn't like that Veiled modifiers felt mandatory to get the highest amount of flat attributes on a specific type on an item and some other changes. There are a host of other small changes which you'll be able to read about in the patch notes. Here are a few specific ones that justify a brief explanation. Focus's cooldown no longer expires while it's active as players were able to keep focus effects up almost permanently. Captain Lance, this is entirely your fault, which provided a huge amount of powerful benefits. You can invest in keeping it up more, but you won't be able to keep it up constantly. This is especially important as now it's one of the few sources of your critical strike chance is lucky from a specific focus modifier. Golem Elementalist no longer provides increased damage per golem. The golem buff effect bonus on Leech of the Primordial now always provides 100% increased effect of buffs granted by your golems rather than scaling with golem count. This ascendancy path was providing too much power and defense compared to other high investment ascendancy effects, so it is now more heavily focused on the buffs granted by golems rather than generic effects. By changing the buff effect on Liege of the Primordial, it creates less of a reliance on having many golems and makes it more powerful in cases where players want to just use a few, uh, if, just use a few instead of feeling forced reliance into maximum golems to various unique items. The Raiders Ascendancy node Rapid Assault no longer provides Onslaught effect. The Onslaught path was too easy a choice relative to the higher investment Frenzy Charge branch. We've also replaced movement speed on the small phasing passives with elemental damage, as there was already plenty of speed available on that ascendancy. Abyss Jewels can no longer roll the modifier that grants chance to gain Onslaught on kill. This low opportunity cost modifier was a no-brainer, providing strong attack, cast, and move speed values that devalued all other sources of Onslaught and were too strong for a single dual modifier. Spectral Shield Throw was used almost exclusively with its threshold dual, Divide and Conquer, and high levels. Because of this, we've changed the skill to naturally have behavior similar to what Divide and Conquer applied. It will release all projectiles each time it chains, making it far stronger than before with sources of additional projectiles, and comes with a number of chains. While reviewing this skill, we've made changes to all skills that deal damage based on shield defenses, greatly boosting their damage. These skills 
no longer gain critical strike chance per energy shield, a mechanic that was used very rarely. Instead, the divide and conquer threshold duel has been reworked and is called Seething Fury. Seething Fury provides bonus to critical strike chance and multiplier to shield charge, spectral shield throw and shield crush based on the energy shield from your shield, making this an option for builds that do want to use energy shield based on shields and these skills. These mechanics have all been significantly reduced in power because they were too strong. Fire Burst was reduced in damage and has a slightly longer cooldown. Hollow Palm Technique now gives 40% more attack speed down from 60%. Vile Ground Slam has had its damage adjusted and changed to having reduced enemy stun threshold to match Ground Slam instead of always stunning. Blade Blast has had its area lowered and no longer unnerves on hit, but has had its area multiplier with Blade Vortex increased to compensate. We have changed all existing unarmed unique items and stats to specifically work with melee skills. The upcoming skill, Explosive Concoction, was designed to work without any of these, so Facebreakers, Doriani's Fist, Rigwall's Curse, Hollow Palm Technique, and Martial Artistry have been changed. Buffs to underperforming skills. One more sip of coffee before we continue. As well as the aforementioned buffs to almost all skills that use melee weapons, a few bow skills, wait, let's move back. Yes, all skills that use melee weapons, a few bow skills and cooldown traps. We've made some numerical buffs to a number of skills that weren't measuring up to their counterparts. As usual, we've buffed Firestorm. <laughs> it now deals 20% more damage at gem level 20, and its first impact now deals 325% more damage up from 200%, 250% more damage. The strike frequency of Lightning Spire Trap now scales with increases and reductions to trap throwing speed instead of cast speed. Lightning Spire Trap now deals 25% more damage at all gem levels. Seismic Trap now deals 40% more damage at all gem levels. Seismic Trap's small burst have a radius of 9 up from 7, uh, which is about a 28% more area of effect. Seismic Trap's large burst now have a radius of 18 up from 12. 50% more area of effect. The wave frequency of Seismic Trap now scales with increases and reductions to trap throwing speed instead of cast speed. The rotation speed of Flamethrower Trap no longer scales with increases to cast speed. It can no longer be modified. Shock Nova's Ring no longer deals 50% less damage. It now deals full damage so enemies in the ring take twice as much damage. Explosive Arrow now deals 5% more damage with hits and ailments per Explosive Arrow on the target, up from 3. Artillery Ballista now deals approximately 10% more damage at all gem levels. Ice Storm, granted by the Whispering Ice unique item, now deals 3 to 5 cold damage per 10 intelligence, up from 2 to 4 cold damage per 10 intelligence. Body Swap now has a base radius of 14, up from 10, but only 200% more area of effect if consuming a corpse. This results in a radius of 42 when consuming a corpse, so it is still higher. Spark now deals more base damage and has reduced growth. This results in dealing approximately 40% more damage at gem level 1, 10% more at gem level 20, and less beyond that. It deals less damage than it did before at gem level 40, but higher or the same at other levels. Barrage now deals 47% of base attack damage at gem level 1, up from 40, and 54.6% of base attack damage at gem level 20, up from 47.6. This is approximately 17% more damage at, at gem level 1, and 15% more damage at gem level 20. Stormburst's base radius now increases faster with levels, resulting in plus 4 to base radius at gem level 20, up from plus 2. Solren's base damage has been increased and growth has been slightly reduced, resulting in dealing 20% more damage at gem level 1 and 10% more damage at gem level 20. It never deals less damage than it dealt before, even up to gem level 40. Stormcall's growth has been increased, resulting in dealing approximately 25% more damage at gem level 20 and more at higher levels. Lightning Tendril's strong pulses now deal 100% more damage with hits and ailments, up from 50%. Lightning Arrow no longer has increases to shock effect, 
As a result, it now has a higher value of shock as though dealing X% percent more damage as the gem levels, dealing 290% at gem level 20 with no change at gem level 1. Lightning Arrow now deals 130% of base attack damage at gem level 1, up from 110%, up to 154% of base attack damage at gem level 20, up from 134%. This is approximately an 18% damage increase at gem level 1 and 14% at gem level 20. Rolling Magma, damage growth, her level has been increased and now deals 20% more damage at gem level 20 and more at higher levels. The amount of gold damage dealt per frenzy charge on discharge has been raised to match fire damage and endurance, uh, per endurance charge. This increase of approximately 22% more cold damage dealt. The minimum amount of lightning damage dealt per power charge has been slightly increased and the maximum slightly reduced. This results in the same average damage as the other two elements but deals approximately 5% less overall lightning damage per power charge. Split Arrow now has an attack speed of 110% of base, up from 100%. Flame Blast now deals 130% more spell damage for each stage, up from 110%. Vile Flame Blast now deals 140% more spell damage for each stage, up from 120%. There are plenty of other smaller changes to be found in the patch notes, most of which are self-explanatory. That wraps up this balance manifesto. As you can imagine, there are so many significant changes to the feel of the game as a result of the mechanical changes that affect all players, so we'll be keeping a very close eye on feedback. Thank you so much for watching or listening everybody, I hope this has been a very nice fireplace manifesto text to speech and you have enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comments down below what is your most favourite and least favourite part of this manifesto. And as always, remember to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Badger, out.